uh, welcome. This is going to be the first um, video lecture for our course in social inequality. And basically what I like to do in these video lectures is to uh, go through the PowerPoint presentations, which are posted on your Canvas page and kind of talk through the slides, uh, hopefully to add a little bit of context or um, further information that you know makes this more valuable than just um, like looking at the slides on your own. So I'm gonna go to the screen share function now and um, pull up your PowerPoint. And um, that'll be basically the basis for the video lecture. Um, so uh, as a welcome to the course, um, we want to emphasize a couple of things. Um, first of all, the scope of the course, um, and uh, also uh, what I think of as its uh, significance uh, at, in this time. Um, so as American society and the, and the world at large become more and more unequal, social inequality has become an increasingly important topic in sociology. Uh, a very significant course, which is why we um, situate it like this within our curriculum as a department. Uh, the main focus of Social 272 is going to be on social inequalities in the United States. Um, but of course, the fact is that we live in an increasingly interconnected world system that makes it difficult to separate individual nation states. And so at different times in the course, I will, of course, refer to uh, the global situation or maybe some international comparisons or um, larger processes of, of globalization um, in order to situate what's going on um, here in the United States. Um, but the focus will be um, primarily uh, if not exclusively on uh, American society. And so the, the key questions that we're going to address over the course of the semester, um, starting with this first question, what is social inequality and how do we measure it statistically in terms of wealth, poverty, and income? Uh, and um, That'll be, again, the basis for this uh, first lecture, especially the statistical measurements of these sorts of things. And then from there, um, secondly, how have sociological theorists sought to understand social inequality using concepts like class, status, and cultural capital? Uh, how do these sorts of inequality intersect with those of race and gender? in a called matrix of domination. Um, this will be the topic really of like classes three, four, and five. Um, so we'll be uh, leaning there a little bit more on sociological theories uh, to explain why it is that we see these uh, forms of inequality and to understand how different forms of inequality uh, intersect with one another. Um, in this uh, so-called matrix of domination. Third, um, how have the dynamics of social inequality changed over time? What economic and political factors have caused social inequality to worsen since the 1970s? Um, these are questions that we we'll begin to um, uh, consider in this first lecture but that'll be really addressed um, in, in more in subsequent lectures. And uh, the 1970s, um, as we'll see, is a really important, um, like pivotal turning point um, in which inequalities uh, really began to worsen, uh, to become more extreme in this society after decades in which um, inequalities had actually uh, been shrinking um, since around uh, World War II or right after World War II, there had been um, a, a reduction uh, for several decades uh, in the amount of inequality. And so we'll kind of try to uh, 
um, begin to uh, understand and explain why this is um, beginning with this class um, and, and um, going into subsequent uh, lectures. Um, fourth, how are inequalities reproduced from generation to generation? How are inequalities reproduced in A, social institutions like uh, schooling, family, work, uh, the state, um, and secondly, in systems of representation like the media, language, and culture? Uh, that'll be the emphasis of like the middle part of the semester. Um, so, you know, roughly, I, I guess, weeks seven through 10, uh, we'll be looking at these various institutions, uh, the educational system, um, the, uh, the like family and, and work and state. Um, and then uh, we'll look at, you know, like culture, language and the media, these so-called um, systems of representation and the role that they play like ideologically in reproducing social inequality. And then uh, we wrap up the course, um, hopefully on a more like kind of hopeful note with asking how have social movements resisted inequality and sought social change? Um, what can be done to transform the social institutions and systems of representation that perpetuate inequality? I try to give us uh, a, reasons for some optimism um, throughout the whole semester. Um, otherwise, this, this class gets kind of bleak. Um, but especially at the end of the semester, um, we turn the focus towards social movements and uh, resistance to forms of inequality. Uh, the two texts, um, I emphasize this both on the syllabus and in uh, on your Canvas page. Just one more time here, I want to emphasize that these are the two required texts for the course, and they're absolutely important um, for the assignments, uh, for both the quizzes and the writing assignments that you'll have on a, on a weekly basis, um, given that this is an online course. Uh, so it's very important for you to get your hands on these uh, as soon as possible. Um, I've put links on both the Canvas page and on the syllabus as to um, places you know, where you can get the, uh, at least the age of inequality you can get through the San Francisco State Library. Um, the, uh, the, the larger and more expensive text, uh, the social construction of difference and in inequality is gonna be the one that you'll use for your um, bi-weekly writing assignments. And uh, that you can rent, um, I, I put a, a link uh, where you can rent the ebook version of that. And um, obviously to, to buy the physical copy, there, there should be uh, physical copies in the, uh, the bookstore on campus. So make sure you get a hold of those um, as soon as you can. Uh, in this lecture, um, it's gonna, we're going to have a mostly kind of quantitative or statistical overview of wealth, poverty, and inequality in the United States. Um, and the reason for this is that, you know, in addition to understanding inequality, one outcome, one like objective that we uh, like to, you know, try to achieve in Social 272 is um, statistical literacy. Uh, that is to say, how to decipher quantitative data, graphs, charts, statistics, and so forth. Um, because that is uh, an important part of sociology and, and social science in general. And also just an important uh, tool, a uh, skill for everyone in this society uh, to be able to have. So it's not always everybody's favorite thing to do. People are more averse to numbers than others, um, but nonetheless, uh, it's very significant and um, something that will, one of the, the, the sort of objectives that we build into the, into the course. Um, and then um, 
having you know introduced this kind of statistical landscape of inequality in the first lecture what we'll do in the remaining lectures is basically to try to explain why um why are these social processes occurring why are they like getting worse um and again to do that we'll draw from sociological theories and recent scientific studies um, many of which are included um, in your in your textbooks um, the themes uh, therefore of this lecture will be first uh, we'll give you kind of a statistical landscape um, first of the uh, distribution of income and wealth and then secondly of the extent of uh, poverty and its relationship to uh, other forms of social inequality. And then in the third part of the lecture, we'll consider how all of these things got worse as a result of uh, the COVID-19 crisis, um, you know, the sort of the most um, overwhelming crisis of our own times. And then a uh, fourth, I'll get you set up for your first film in the course, um, which is called Inequality for All. And that's a, basically a documentary uh, done by the um, a former secretary of, secretary of Labor named Robert Reich, in which he um, looks at a lot of these, these same kind of larger sociological trends, but also um, puts a human face on some of these problems by uh, interviewing people and, and looking at how these um, these processes that impact people in their day-to-day -day life. So that'll be the first film uh, that you'll have. You'll have films every other week uh, through the semester. Okay, so for this first question, what do we mean by social inequality and how do we measure it? Um, when we talk about social inequality, we can define it as a system of power and domination uh, which determines people's access to resources like housing, healthcare, education, and employment. Um, the sort of the core necessities of the social life. Uh, so we'll be looking at various ways in which um, systems of power and domination determine people's access to those very significant resources. And then uh, in this lecture, we'll be looking at the measures of social inequality um, as uh, in terms of income and in terms of wealth, um, which are sometimes confused, but it's very important to distinguish these two, these two things. When we talk about income, we're talking about money that is received on a regular basis through uh, your salary, your wages, uh, or you know, transfer payments uh, like social security, um, or, you know, investments. And so basically income is like what you earn each week or each month or each year, uh, whatever, you know, time frame we're talking about. Um, but for most people, you know, it's, it's their take home pay, their paycheck, their tips, um, possibly, you know, social security or some other kind of benefit. Uh, um, and then, you know, if, if, if you're, uh, in the more privileged sectors of society than, you know, something like, you know, out of your investments or some kind of other passive income like rent. Um, when we talk about wealth, um, there that refers to the sum total of one's assets. Um, so, you know, what a, a person or a family owns. Uh, so your car, your stocks and bonds, your home, your art, you know, anything that you own that's valuable. Um, so for most people, uh, as we'll see in the charts ahead, the, the home is their primary source of wealth. Um, for the more, uh, uh, for the wealthier segments of society, it's more likely to be their financial assets, their business equity, their stocks and bonds, those sorts of things will be the primary source of their wealth. Um, but for most of society, um, it's uh, the, the value of your home is the main thing that, that people own, um, if they own anything at all. 
Um, so first, let's look at the distribution of income. Um, and here we see uh, American society basically divided into five different groups, um, which we statistically call quintiles, um, as in you know, uh, five groups that represent 20% of the population. Um, the green uh, line here is the richest quintile, uh, the top uh, 20% of workers. And uh, as it shows here in the uh, chart, they basically take a home about 50%, a, a little over half of all the income uh, in American society. Um, while the lowest quintile, the, the lowest paid 20% of people take home only about 3.5%. Um, the average income for those households in uh, the, the highest quintile, the green line, is about $357,000 a year, um, which is roughly 16 times the average income of households in the lowest quintile, which is about uh, $21,900 a year. And um, you'll see uh, you can see quite clearly that the gap representing the richest 20% from the rest of the population has increased rather noticeably um, since the 1970s. So if you look back at the, at the, on the left side of that chart uh, at 1970 and 1975, you know, then it's like the, the, the wealthiest or the, the, the most highly paid um, people are taking home, you know, more like 40, you know, like low 40s, maybe up to 45%. Um, it's not until the 2000s uh, that they, um, they, they go over 50%. And so the gap basically separating the, the highest 20%, the green line, and the rest uh, the rest of us, the, the bottom 80%, um, has gotten more extreme um, in uh, the 1970s, since the 1970s. And again, this is, the, this is a, a trend of worsening inequality that we're going to um, unpack and, and hopefully solve the mystery of as the semester goes on. Now, when we look at the distribution of wealth, we're talking about an even more extreme um, distribution of inequality. Uh, the distribution of wealth is significantly more unequal than the distribution of the income, um, which as we just saw is, is, is pretty extreme, but uh, nothing like what we see when we talk about the distribution of wealth. When we talk about the distribution of wealth, the, the, the wealthiest 10% own about three quarters of all of the wealth uh, in the United States. So uh, that's represented in this pie chart, you know, where you have like 13.2 million families that own like 74% of the wealth. Um, the next 40% uh, own most of the other quarter. So they, you know, we got 52.5 million families that own 24% uh, of the wealth. And then you got like, basically half the country that is uh, splitting the remaining 2%. Um, so the bottom 50% own um, little or, or nothing. So to give you the sort of the statistical landmarks of this, um, to be in the top 10%, uh, a family would need, you know, one, about $2 million in wealth. Um, so that's what we're talking about as far as the top 10% is people who have at least like $2 million in, in wealth or more. Um, in the next 40%, um, the family, the average is around, or the, the low mark is around $192,000. So for people that have, you know, $200,000 or more in wealth. So there in that green part of the chart, we're mostly talking people that, talking about people that own their own home um, or they own a home that's worth $200,000 or more, um, which, you know, in the Bay Area is like nothing, but in, the, you know, the rest of the country, um, 
<laughs> is still, uh, you know, considered to be relatively uh, okay. Um, in to be in the bottom fifty percent means that a family has uh, less than one hundred and ninety-two thousand dollars in wealth, and of this group, um, about nine point nine million families have negative self worth. Um, basically meaning that their debts are greater than their assets. So um, that's the distribution of wealth in general. Now we want to turn our focus to um, the super wealthy. Um, and again, here, what we see is a trend of growing inequality that's even more extreme than what we saw looking at uh, income. So the distribution of wealth is increasingly concentrated at the very top among the so-called 1%. The richest 1% of the US population owns about 35% of the country's total wealth. Um, and again, this is a big change from what we saw in the 1970s uh, and before where the richest 1% owned only about say 20% of the wealth. So this is represented here in this chart. Um, you know, the 1% the are the, the purple line and the top 10% are the green line. And as you can see very clearly here, um, they both widen the gap, um, separating them from the rest of the population. But the 1% has done so um, even more extremely at a kind of an exponential rate. Um, and so the average personal wealth of people in the top 1% is now more than a thousand times that of the people uh, in the bottom half, the bottom 50% of the country. Um, and the wealthiest 1% of families uh, saw their personal wealth increase from about 1.8 million to uh, what it stands today, uh, an average of 15.8 million. And that's again represented by this very dramatic uptick uh, in the purple line uh, in the graph that you see ahead there. Um, and so again, like we see the same pattern um, of growing inequality that we saw with the distribution of income, but in an even more extreme form. Now, this is important. The distribution of wealth is, is, is important for a number of reasons, um, both you know, in the context of people's day-to-day -day life, um, but also in terms of our larger uh, political system, uh, social policy, all of these sorts of things, it basically has meant that the super wealthy are able to exercise more and more power um, over uh, the the nation state of uh, the United States um, and you know around the world, um, and we you know refer to this as um, a, a kind of a dynastic wealth. Um, at the same time that the wealthy have been uh, accruing more and more wealth at this uh, exponential rate, um, they've also been paying less taxes. Um, as you see in this graph here, um, the effective uh, tax rates of the wealthiest 400 families has steadily declined since around 1960. Um, to the point that they actually are paying a lower effective tax rate than the bottom 50% of the population. Um, this is obviously an infuriating graph uh, to look at and like, you know, part of the wealthiest 400 families. This is, this is something that, you know, makes me want to go take a long walk <laughs> and uh, just like, but uh, you you can just see this this trend, um, and of course this it has to do again with the 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 increasing political power of this class, so that you know they have 
um, consistently lobbied to have their their tax rates reduced. And the more wealth that they're able to accrue, the more they're able to like buy off, you know, politicians from both political parties um, and have, you know, le legislation and tax cuts that are favorable to their interests. This was, in fact, the one legislative accomplishment of the Trump administration was to um, cut taxes even further uh, in 2018, as you see represented in this in this graph here. Um, and, uh, you know, it's something that like in the 1980s, you know, this was justified along the lines of, um, you know, what was called then trickle down economics or, or Reaganomics because it was Ronald Reagan that really, you know, perpetuated this idea that if you cut taxes for the wealthy, then, you know, the wealth will trickle down and they'll create jobs and it'll be good for everybody. And then, you know, we had decades where it was evident that th that just didn't happen, um, that, you know, the rich, the rich just got richer and, you know, the, the wealth did not trickle down at all. And so now it's, you know, it's uh, that kind of ideological argument has lost a lot of its luster. Um, but because this group, this class has so much political power, they're able to continue. Uh, they've been able to continue um, to have their their wealth taxes eroded. Um, and so that is basically what, you know, I think is is explained uh, here in this in this graph and this slide. Um, so to look at the, the sources of wealth um, in among these different uh, among these different groups here, here um, in represented in this graph um, also tells an important story um, statistically. Uh, again, as I said, uh, for most Americans, their home is their most valuable source of wealth. Um, but it matters. It, it the, the the profile of people's wealth changes very dramatically. Um, at, if we you know when we look at this graph, uh, this chart, um, you know more closely. So this one again is is divided into like uh, like four groups. So the the bottom twenty five percent. Um, up to the uh, richest 25%, but then um, it also includes um, bar graphs for the top 10% and the top 1% to show kind of like their, the distribution of the things that they own. So you know, for like the bottom 25%, um, most of what people own is just like whatever they, whatever possessions they have. Um, the, the yellow... Uh, part of the graph that says net non-financial wealth. Um, and so that's like their car, the clothes on their back, you know, like whatever, like basically like possessions um, people might have. And then as you go, you know, along the, the right side of the chart, um, you notice that, you know, the green part of the, uh, of the bar um, is more significant. And so that is the part that is, is home equity. So for the sort of like the middle 25, the middle like uh, 50 to 75 group, um, the most valuable thing that they have is their, their, their home, um, their home equity. And then that green part kind of shrinks as you get into the wealthier and wealthier segments uh, of the society. Um, the purple part starts to expand. Uh, that is net other financial wealth. Plays a little bit of, of a role for the 50 to 75 group, more of a role for the 75 to 90. And then for the top 1%, it's like, you know, like the biggest part of their portfolio. So when we talk about um, both net financial uh, wealth and uh, business equity, we're talking about like stocks and bonds. Uh, we're talking, you know, financial investments, 
uh, investments in real estate, other kinds of um, uh, financial assets um, that people uh, have been trading. And, and, you know, there's been a sort of a whole like multiplication of all of these various kinds of financial assets, even, you know, people investing in other people's debt, um, you know, to, uh, what they call collateralized debt obligations. Um, so a whole variety of like financial instruments. This has become the main source of wealth. Basically, as you get to the richest classes, this is the main thing that they own. You notice that the green part of the bar, their home equity, becomes just like a small fraction of their wealth. Um, really, the, the main thing is their their financial assets and business equity. And um, and then finally, like there's, you know, the re retirement accounts. So, you know, for the sort of the middle parts of the society, this is a very valuable thing, your, your you know, your pension and, and uh, retirement accounts. Um, but, you know, for the 1%, it's just like a drop in the bucket. Um, it's, it'll be important, um, to think about, you know, here we, we start to turn to thinking about how these, these inequalities of social class, um, intersect with inequalities of, of race. And then we'll also look at gender and, and other forms of social inequality. Um, we'll be kind of, um, pursuing this question and this topic in a few different lectures. Um, but we'll start here with just introducing using the statistical fact that the gap between black and white families um, is uh, very significant and has in fact uh, not shrunk, but has, uh, if anything, has grown over time. Um, and the reason for this gap, this racial wealth gap, as we'll call it, is rooted in historical practices and policies like redlining, uh, like housing discrimination. Um, we'll explore those topics, you know, more in subsequent lectures. But the effect of this kind of like housing discrimination has been to systematically strip wealth from black families. Um, and as we'll see in the next slide from Latino families um, and facilitated uh, while facilitating wealth building among white families. And um, because of that, uh, these continued barriers um, and uh, the intergenerational nature of wealth, it becomes very difficult for individuals or families to overcome these gaps. So here's where wealth really matters in the sort of day-to-day -day, uh, lives of people who you know, aren't necessarily like rich, but if they own their own home, they can, you know, finance, they're more likely to be able to finance their child going to college, or they're likely to be able to pay for, you know, emergencies or moments of, you know, being laid off. And it's like, if you don't have that wealth, uh, if you don't have that kind of like home equity, then you, you're like missing uh, like a, a cushion, a kind of a safety net. Um, when a disaster, illness, injury, you know, uh, any of those kinds of life circumstances pop up. And so the effect of this um, uh, housing discrimination, you know, going back to, you know, 100 years or more has been, you know, the uh, cumulative lack of intergenerational wealth. So white families' wealth uh, in 2022, on average, uh, the median wealth was $287,000. Um, and as a group, white families owned about 85% uh, of total, total household wealth, but made up um, only 66% of households. So basically, they owned a, dis uh, a disproportionate amount of the nation's wealth, whereas among Black families, the Black family's medium wealth was $45,000 in 2022. Um, as a group, of Black families owned about 2% of household wealth, despite making up 11% of households. So again, like a disproportionate um, lack of wealth within the Black community. 
uh, black families had, in other words, 16 cents per dollar of the white Indian family. Um, and uh, the black white gap had grown um, from 200 uh, by to 242 thousand dollars by 2022, um, as illustrated by the uh, chart on the left side, um, which shows the the gaps and sort of how they've changed. And you know, even though there was uh, an increase in black wealth during 2022, it was outpaced by the median gains in wealth among white families. Um, we see a relatively similar story um, when we compare uh, white families with so-called Hispanic or Latinx families. Um, again, uh, with his, uh, Hispanic families, the median wealth is about <clears throat> $61,000. Um, so a little bit more than black families, uh, but not much. Um, and as a group, uh, uh, Hispanic families make up about 14% of all households, but own only 4% of the total household wealth. And that comes out to about 21 cents on the dollar and a racial wealth gap of uh, $226,000. Now, we want to um, look at how that wealth gap intersects with uh, race and gender at the same time, um, as uh, illustrated in this little um, uh, this pictorial. What do we call this? A, a, a an infograph um, on the left side. Uh, this shows how that wealth concentration is magnified by. Uh, gender and racial inequalities, that the gender wealth gap is considerably larger than um, the gender wage gap, All right? So the gender wage gap is about for every like dollar um, earned by a man in the workforce, uh, women make about 80 cents. Um, but the wealth gap is more extreme. Um, the wealth gap is more like 55 cents for every dollar of wealth owned by families headed by men. Um, and then as the infograph shows, the gender wealth gaps become even more stark and uh, vary even more when viewed by race and ethnicity. So for example, families headed by black and Hispanic women um, are owning only five to 10 uh, cents for every dollar of median wealth held by families headed by white men. And uh, large gender gaps then indicate, and, and again, this is like why this is so important in the context of people's lives. These large wealth, uh, gender wealth gaps indicated that many women headed households have smaller financial cushions than those headed by men. And we really saw this, you know, during like COVID. Um, savings and other assets blunt the impact of personal economic crises like losing incomes or being laid off, which occurred disproportionately for women during the COVID-19 recession. Because a lot of women were working in service jobs and, you know, or disproportionately in those kinds of jobs where they were more likely to be laid off as a result of the pandemic. And when that happened, they had less of a financial safety cushion to be able to fall back on. So this is why this kind of lack of intergenerational wealth is such a problem in the context of people's everyday life and became worse um, when, uh, you know, during, uh, during COVID. Um, so now we want to switch the focus towards poverty. Um, now, how do we define poverty? Uh, we're going to just kind of go with the standard U.S. government um, definition of poverty, which is basically it defines um, poverty as being a, below a certain income in relation to uh, one's food budget. 
Um, this was a um, this was a standard uh, a definition of poverty that was set in the 1960s, and it's basically um, remained the since ever since um, remain the same. And many argue that. Um, this actually underrepresents the extent of poverty in the United States uh, because the costs of other necessities like housing, health care, child care, um, all of those things have increased at a much faster rate than the increase in the price of food. I mean, we do know that, you know, there's been, especially recently, an, an inflationary increase in the price of food. But these other things, especially housing, health care, and childcare have all out outpaced that, and so if anything, um, measuring poverty in terms of a food budget is really undercounting the amount of people who are out there struggling. Um, you know, not, not just food insecure, but like housing insecure, um, and so you know, with that in mind, you know you can kind of take these numbers with a grain of salt and um, imagine that, that in reality, they'd be actually much higher. Um, and perhaps for political reasons, um, the way that we define poverty has not changed, um, even though it would kind of make sense to do so. But by this official measure, about 37.9 million Americans live in poverty. And that amounts to about 11.5% of the population. The uh, map here on the right side shows you how this uh, poverty is distributed geographically across the country. Um, so basically, the redder um, the part of the map, uh, the more poverty that you find in that region. Um, so we see, you know, like the, the South. Um, has the southern states just have a, a higher uh, rate of poverty than the rest of the country. Also, like around uh, parts of the southwest, around uh, eastern Arizona and uh, western New Mexico, some of south Texas, um, uh, further north up towards um, South Dakota. Um, keep in mind that, you know, the thing that uh, like South Dakota has in common with like uh, Western New Mexico is that that's where a lot of like uh, reservations are, like uh, where indigenous people are are living on reservations and um, indigenous people have like the highest poverty rate uh, of all in the United States. Um, so, you know, that is kind of what a graph looks like. Uh, we have kind of less lower poverty rates in the Northeast and uh, a lot of uh, the Great Lakes region. Um, within California, uh, you see uh, higher poverty rates around the Central Valley um, and also, you know, down around the border and um, like Eastern uh, San Diego, um, you know, East of San Diego. Uh, so that is basically you know, giving us a kind of a, a geographic sense of, of how poverty is distributed um, in the country. Now, we want to think about these things historically um, uh, as well in terms of how these, tra uh, these trends have changed over time. So as this graph shows, starting in the 1960s, the U.S. dramatically reduced its poverty rate through social programs and policies that were then known as the war on poverty. So if you look at the, the left side of these, both of these two um, graphs, you'll see that, you know, in 1959, the poverty rate in the United States was much higher. It was more like around 22 and a half, 23 um, percent. And we had, you know, somewhere on the order of 40 million people living in poverty, even though the country was much smaller. You know, we had like the same number of poor people that basically we do today. Um, and then that num those numbers undertake a, a sharp downturn um, by 1970, right? Both in terms of the number of 
people living under uh, the, the poverty rate and the, the percentage, the overall percentage of the population, both of those declined precipitously um, through the 1960s and into uh, you know about 1970. And then after about 1970, you know the the, the numbers kind of start to kind of flatline. Um, so you know to read this graph, it basically suggests we made a lot of progress as a society in reducing poverty, not eliminating poverty, but, re but reducing poverty um, in the 1960s. And that's not coincidental. Um, there are these programs that were um, instituted by uh, especially the, the Johnson administration, um, known as the War on Poverty, um, that were um, directly intended to um, alleviate uh, uh, poverty throughout the country. And since the 1970s, we've kind of abandoned that those policies approach. Uh, policy approach. Really, um, it's it's been instead of a war on poverty, it's been kind of like a war against poor people. Um, and so, you know, not only have we kind of rolled back a lot of those um, earlier policies and programs, but um, there has been, you know, almost like a punitive approach towards um, uh, towards poor people. So since the 1970s, the poverty rate, as we see, you know, in the in the bottom chart, the green line has basically stagnated, you know, between like. 11 and 15 percent but you know it's never been less than like 10 percent um and so what these um these charts i hope one takeaway from them is is that it reveals that poverty is not inevitable that the poverty is really like a policy choice um poverty can be alleviated it can be reduced through social programs and policies. And we know this because it happened. <laughs> like it happened in the 1960s. Um, we have the statistical evidence to show that like, you know, it's it's not, that, that poverty is not inevitable. It's not like, you know, some people say like, oh, the poor will always be with us and and things of this kind of matter. And, and that is not, that just kind of legitimates and, and it excuses the problem. And a better way, I think, to, to think about it is, is to think about the things that, you know, while they certainly weren't perfect, the, the war on poverty was by no means a, something that I'm extolling as a, as a perfect solution. Um, it obviously had some results. Um, and so the, there'll be a couple of other graphs that, um, in the coming slides that I think will hopefully illustrate the same point. Um, so here, if we look at poverty rates by age group, we also have an interesting story to tell about the impact of social policy. Basically, the United States has been much better at reducing elder poverty, you know, the po poverty among people 65 and older, um, than it has been in reducing child poverty. And this is, again, not a coincidence. It's the result of programs like Social Security and Medicare that were instituted to try to reduce elder poverty. As you see in, 1950, you know, in 1959, on the left part of this, uh, of this chart, um, it, people aged 65 and older had the highest poverty rate in the entire population, um, like 35% of elderly people were living in, in poverty. And with these social programs, we have reduced poverty as you follow, you follow those, that red line um, through the years to the point where by 2015, elder poverty, uh, elderly people had been the least likely to be poor in America, the rate of um, elderly poverty had gone down to 8.8%, a huge successful reduction. Again, not an elimination, but um, some substantial progress that had been made. 
Um, now compare that, say, to the green line, which is the rate of child poverty. Um, people, um, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, the blue line. Um, the, the blue line is people under the age of 18. And again, you know, notice that like, you know, we basically have made little or no progress. Um, and to the point where like in 2015, it was like almost 20% of people under age 18, um, have, uh, were, were living in poverty. So like one out of every five kids in America, basically like in, you know, and, and that speaks to a kind of a comparative absence of these same kinds of anti-poverty measures for children. Um, the uh, poverty rate, you know, basically hovering around 20%, uh, uh, never dipping really below 15% um, throughout all of these decades. So there's a real contrast to be shown here in the way that America has dealt with these two different populations. And again, a real lesson to be learned as far as like the effectiveness of social policies um, in reducing one group's poverty rate, but not the, not the other. Now, another sort of more recent addendum that I think also proves this point is to look at um, some uh, policies that were implemented during COVID, uh, during the early stages of COVID to, to try to um, reduce child poverty that were very successful. Um, but unfortunately, uh, they were not continued. So um, child uh, COVID-related welfare programs dramatically reduced child poverty in 2021, just that one year, um, by 46% to its lowest point on record, which was 5.2%. You know, remember I had just shown you that like, you know, child poverty had been roughly between 15 and 20% for decades. And then in like one year, we got it down to 5.2%. Um, the main policy was this child allowance, uh, which expanded the existing child tax credit and basically just sent money, monthly, pay, uh, monthly payments to parents. And so this um, CTC expansion um, was something that was implemented in 2021, but unfortunately Congress allowed it to expire in 2022. And it was basically this, this vote that, you know, was pretty strictly along party lines, all the Republicans voting, you know, to let it expire. You know, most of the Democrats wanted to continue it um, but then the deciding vote was, you know, Joe Manchin. And if you know anything about Joe Manchin, he's, you know, a, a senator from West Virginia. And um, he's uh, effectively was a, at the time a Democrat. He's no longer a Democrat. He's now an independent. But he often votes with the Republicans, especially on these kind of class issues. And Joe Manchin basically cast the deciding vote along the lines of basically saying, well, if you're giving this, you know, these welfare checks to these parents, they're just going to spend it on drugs. Um, and this is, of course, like a long longstanding um, uh, argument that has been used, you know, to try to cut welfare in this country for decades and decades and decades that, you know, poor people are just like more immoral and they lack self-discipline. And therefore, if you give them money in the form of welfare, they're going to just use it irresponsibly um, because their lack of morality and their lack of self-discipline is the thing that makes them poor in the first place. This is a long-standing ideological argument that gets trotted out all the time as a way to try to legitimate um, cutting uh, welfare and social services for the poor and basically criminalizing poor people. Um, and 
thereby legitimating and justifying these uh, extreme inequalities of wealth that we see in this society. So not surprisingly, as you see in this graph, once the CTT expired in 2022, the rate of child poverty shot back up. Um, but if there is a uh, optimistic takeaway to um, to this these events that happened, you know, very recently, um, just like with the war on poverty in the 1960s, those events demonstrate again that, that poverty is not something that's inevitable or incurable. Um, it's a policy decision. You know, it's it's uh, it's not something that we just have to kind of throw up our hands and just say, well, you know, the poor will always be with us. Now, we want to, in the, these next slides, to consider how poverty rates uh, intersect with gender and uh, with race um, and with other forms of social inequality related to um, uh, gender identity and sexual orientation and, and, uh, and then finally disability. So um, this chart shows here uh, how in almost every group, um, women have higher poverty rates than men. Um, that's not really surprising, I suppose, given um, what we've said earlier about how women statistically make less money than men. Um, that, you know, women make on average about 80 cents for every dollar that a man earns. So it shouldn't be surprising that women have, generally speaking, higher rates of poverty in every um, racial and ethnic group that's listed here, um, with the exception of uh, Asian and, uh, or Pacific Islanders. So the highest poverty rates are experienced by American Indian or American uh, Alaska Native women, um, and uh, then by uh, among Black women and Latinas. Um, about 25% of the um, American Indian and, and uh, Alaskan Native population of, of women is in poverty. And that's the highest rate of poverty among men or uh, among women or men of any racial or ethnic group. Um, so that kind of, again, reiterates the, the point that I made in looking at the map of the United States about the concentration of poverty around um, uh, so-called Indian reservations. Black women, Latinas, um, and uh, American Indian and, and American uh, Alaska Native women are also disproportionately represented among women living in poverty, while Latinas represent about 18.1% of the all women in um, the U.S. population. They constitute about 27.1% one percent of women in poverty. Similarly, Black women represent 22.3 percent women in poverty, but make up only 12.8 percent of all women in the U.S. population. So we're talking that basically uh, Black and Latino women are disproportionately represented among the ranks of poor women. And so this especially becomes um, a, a problem as um, more and more women are raising families as um, single uh, income um, providers. So if you know women are basically raising families um, without a second income in the house, uh, in the household, then you know they're much more likely to be in jeopardy of being in poverty, and their children are, you know, much more likely to be born into poverty. And again, this is you know something that um, is not inevitable, but is in fact like a, a policy uh, decision. Now, how these um, poverty rates intersect with questions of race, gender identity, and sexual orientation. Um, we see here in this graph that the rates of poverty for LGBTQ people of color are close to or higher than 
those for cis straight people uh, of their own racial or ethnic group and are notably higher for uh, white people whether than for white people, whether they're straight or LGBTQ. So, you know, here again, um, with every uh, racial and ethnic group that is listed here, except for so-called Hispanic peoples, um, we see that this is uh, a higher, um, th that this is higher for uh, LGBTQ people. The they're more likely to be in poverty than their cis straight counterparts. Um, LGBTQ uh, women experience higher rates of poverty than cisgender straight women and men due to the intersections of discrimination based on gender, sexual orientation, and gender identity or expression. So we're talking about multiple layers of um, discrimination um, adding on top of one another to explain why it is that we see these um, higher poverty rates. And um, a recent study um, at UCLA um, has also um, found similar kinds of things about um, uh, the percentage of, you know, like gender nonconforming people being basically more um, at risk of poverty than the rest of the population. So, you know, 17.9% of lesbian cisgender women uh, twenty nine point four percent of bisexual cisgender women, and twenty nine percent point four percent of transgender people um, living in poverty. Um, so that's like two or even three times, almost three times the the rate of the rest of the population, which you know, as you'll remember, is um, eleven point five percent. And then finally, we consider how poverty rates intersect with um, gender and disability status. And here, again, we find that people with um, disability status are much more likely to be um, uh, living in poverty than the rest of the population. Um, women with disabilities are more likely to live in poverty than both men with disabilities and individuals without disabilities. Uh, women with disabilities have a poverty rate of 22.9%, per which again is like, like double the national average, um, compared with 17.9% for men with disabilities and 11.4% for women without disabilities. So again, we have like multiple intersecting forms of inequality that are, you know, putting people um, at a greater um, economic vulnerability um, within the within the society. Um, the most dramatic, you know, and certainly, especially here in the Bay Area, um, like the most visible manifestation, um, and you know, probably the most extreme symptom of what we're talking about in terms of poverty uh, would be homelessness. And that is now at a record high um, in America. Uh, in uh, 653,104 people experienced homelessness in the United States uh, at some point in 2023. And that number represents a, uh, like I said, a, a record and a 12% increase from just the previous year, as shown by this, uh, you know, this, uh, this bar graph. Um, basically, the number of uh, unhoused people has kind of fluctuated roughly between, you know, 550 to 600,000 per year. But last year, it went all the way up to over 650,000. And included in that are uh, 111,000 11, children, 111,620 children uh, without homes in America. Um, this is something that um, is now a kind of national issue, um, whereas, you know, uh, Previously, it might have been more concentrated in 
large cities like San Francisco, New York, Los Angeles, and so forth, um, now we see increases in homelessness in 41 out of the 50 states of the country. Um, so this is a, a problem that is now truly like national in scope and not just like limited to, um, you know, coastal big cities. That said, um, still more than one half of the homeless uh, America's unhoused individuals lived in, uh, reside in the nation's 50 largest cities with New York and Los Angeles alone containing about one quarter of those unhoused people. And this is something that is also, um, as you can imagine, is kind of disproportionately represented among people of color um, and those who, you know, have, uh, you know, are more likely to have, you know, low incomes or no incomes. Um, but it's something that's also pervasive among every ethnic group, as this chart says here, uh, every ethnic group endured an increase in homelessness last year. In the Bay Area, um, we'll be sort of looking at this question in more depth um, later in the semester, I'll talk about a lot of things related to the Bay Area and the housing crisis and, you know, like, why is the rent so high and like, you know, what, um, and a, a big part of that too is like, why are there so many people um, living on the streets or so many people, you know, living in, you know, RVs next to Lake Merced or, you know, people, they're, they're housing insecure all over the Bay Area. Um, on any given night, approximately 7,500 7, to 8,000 people are unhoused in San Francisco and something like 35 to 37,000 people in the Bay Area at large. Um, California is the leading state uh, for homelessness in the United States. This is, um, as we will explore, you know, in more depth, but I don't have time to fully get into here. This is a symptom of this housing crisis and, and specifically a lack of affordable housing. Um, not a lack of housing per se, but a lack of affordable housing um, is really at the, at, the, at the crux of this issue. Um, and so the lack of affordable housing is spoken to by the fact that in San Francisco, a minimum wage worker would have to work approximately 4.7 full-time jobs, which is of course impossible, um, to be able to uh, spend less than 30% of their income on renting a two bedroom apartment. And, and this is again, more extreme in, in San Francisco, but the, but the rest of the country is, is rapidly catching up to San Francisco in terms of this affordability crisis and the discrepancy between people's wages and the increasing cost of rent. Um, and so this is why, you know, it might be more extreme in the Bay Area, but like you're seeing this problem everywhere um, in the United States now. So um, those are issues, like I said, that um, I'll have to leave for a later part of the semester to really fully get into because it is, you know, a, a kind of a complicated issue. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it's fun to sort of keep in mind for this question of, of social inequality and its, and its most extreme manifestations that we see, you know, here in the Bay Area on a day-to-day -day basis. So we want to get into this question of now, um, you know, we've looked at all of these trends um, and, you know, kind of like how they started getting worse in the 1970s and, and so forth. But then, you know, the most recent crisis of our times, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, really accelerated a lot of these trends that were already ongoing, but it's like COVID kind of put the foot on the gas pedal and, and made them worse uh, and intensified them, not because of like COVID itself, but because of the, the way that the society 
you know, was structured before COVID kind of allowed these processes to get even worse in a time of crisis. Um, in the same way that like other kinds of crises also make, you know, exacerbate the pre-existing inequalities in a society. So like an earthquake or a flood or, you know, a hurricane, any of those things, or, or a financial disaster for that matter. All of those things tend to hit uh, the most vulnerable, uh, poorest people in society. They hit those people the hardest. Um, and conversely, the people who are already wealthy are often able to capitalize on these crises. And in fact, that is definitely what happened in COVID um, as uh, billionaire wealth skyrocketed, um, mainly by squeezing workers and consumers. We'll look at the uh, graph um, uh, or uh, just the, the numbers here in the next slide to, to show just how much richer the billionaire class got, but they all ex increased their wealth um, tremendously um, as a result of COVID-19. Um, higher income, income uh, individuals have also been more likely to work at home. So they've been, you, you know, kind of like cushioned from the worst impacts, whereas low wage workers had higher uh, pandemic job losses. Um, Non-union workers uh, have been more likely to lose their jobs compared to workers who were represented by a union. Um, COVID-19 death and hospitalization rates were much higher among people of color and black and Latinx people were less likely to telework um, or and, and therefore to face higher unemployment rates. So all of these trends we will now look at in um, a kind of a statistical overview. Um, first, the uh, billionaires. This basically shows you how the richest, um, the you know, the richest people in America, the, the 15 richest people, um, all made out like bandits uh, in just a year and a half um, in the period between March 18th, 2020, um, when, you know, everything kind of shut down um, until October 15th, 2021, which is 19 months later. Uh, a little bit more than a year and a half. All of these people um, increased their wealth by at least $10 billion. Elon Musk, um, at the top of that list, um, increased his wealth by $184 billion. So like $10 billion a month. Um, that's a 751% um, increase in his wealth from where it was before COVID. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I mean, Elon Musk is the most extreme um, example on this list, but they all, as a class, um, not a single one of them suffered. Um, and in, if anything, they all uh, increased, you know, uh, in total, as it says here at the very bottom of the chart, uh, they increased their wealth by $732 billion. Um, on average, most of them almost doubled. Um, an 86.6% increase is means basically you almost doubled your wealth in 19 months. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of... That's kind of <laughs> infuriating also. It makes it also, <laughs> once again, I wanted to get, take a long walk. <laughs> um, and, okay, so, but then, you know, as, as we kind of scale down the social structure a little bit more, like, so in terms of like during COVID, the question of like who could work from home and who was a so-called like essential worker who still had to go, you know, and, you know, go in and do their job. Um, this is, you know, very much stratified by social class so that, you know, the, the more affluent Americans who are more likely to be white uh, had a lot more flexibility in terms of working at home, um, which then 
lowered their exposure to physical, mental, and economic harms that were being done by COVID. And so basically as this, you know, bar graph shows us like the higher the income, the more likely you were to work from home, you know? So the people who are making $200,000 a year or more are the, the ones that like, you know, over 70% of them were, you know, transferred over to like telework. And so, yeah, basically the higher the income, uh, the more likely you were to just um, be on Zoom all day. Um, and then the people who were the most vulnerable were the low income workers. So the low income workers, people making less than 25,000 or, you know, between 25 and 35,000 or 35 and 50,000, those people were, you know, only like 20% of them were like able to like, you know, stay at home. Right. So um, we had to find a real discrepancy there, obviously. And of course that would have all of these implications, not just for um, the workers themselves, but their whole communities, you know, in terms of people being more or less uh, exposed um, in, you know, uh, to the disease, um, you know, so low income communities, you know, were much more um, vulnerable in this sense than, you know, the high income communities that could kind of like wall themselves off from, from this. Um, we find the same story when we look basically at, at job losses. So basically like the lower your income, the more likely you were to lose your job, you know, in the first place. Um, so the, you know, the pandemic recession, you know, especially like in the first few months of, of COVID really hit low income workers the hardest. Um, and uh, the chart just basically shows, again, um, in a pretty straightforward way, you know, the, the blue lines are the ones that are representing the lowest income uh, or second lowest income workers. And they were the ones that were much more likely to, to lose their jobs. They might have been working in, you know, the service industry or, you know, the fast food or something like that. Um, and, and so they were real, really in jeopardy. Um, so this was like, you know, literally a time where like the rich got richer and the poor got poorer, like at, a, at an accelerated rate. Um, okay, so the, the, the first film um, that we're going to be looking at, you know, ex um, explains uh, a lot of the things that we've talked about in this first lecture or and and like I said, kind of puts tries to put a, a kind of a human face on this, and it also starts to um, try to piece together this puzzle of trying to explain why um, these inequalities have gotten uh, more and more extreme in our lifetimes. Um, the film was made before COVID, but. Um, you know, still the things that we just looked at in the preceding slides show that like, this is like been a, a trend of worsening inequality that's been going on for a while. So this uh, person that made the, um, the, the documentary centers is a guy by the name of Robert Reich. He was the secretary of labor under uh, Bill Clinton um, in Bill Clinton's first administration. And then he resigned from the Clinton administration in 1996 after Clinton was reelected, um, basically because Clinton like wasn't taking any of his advice, and you know Clinton wasn't uh, was was doing. Robert Reich was basically proposing to do things that were favorable towards workers and poor people, and uh, and and Clinton was was more. Uh, on the side of, of the wealthy. And so Robert Reich eventually just kind of resigned. Um, since then, he's gone on 
um, to a number of uh, things. He occasionally appears as a talking head on television news. And um, he also teaches a, a class at UC Berkeley that is kind of like the class that you're in now. I think the class is called like wealth, income and poverty or something like that. But he teaches this enormous class or has taught this enormous class at Berkeley. I'm not sure if he does any more. Um, but the film kind of follows him, you know, you see him sometimes teaching at Berkeley and then sometimes he's out, you know, talking to, to other people and, you know, uh, interviewing them. And um, he's trying to piece together again, this, this puzzle of how inequality began to increase in the 1970s after decades in which it had been um, declining. And that's kind of represented in this um, chart that you have here that's taken from the film where he shows that the, the peak times when the 1% was taking home the largest share of income, um, the first peak of this was in 1928. And then you see that, you know, over the next few decades, that share kind of steadily declined um, you know, all through the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, and up in, you know, through the 1970s, you know, we see that the, the share of the, like the share of the whole pie that the 1% is taking is getting smaller, right? So that the rich are still rich, but they're taking home a, a shrinking amount of the income. And then it, it begins to increase again in the 1980s and the 1990s and the 2000s. And it reaches its second peak in 2007. So what do 1928 and, 19, and 2007 have in common? Well, they both came, they were both like right before huge economic catastrophes, huge crises um, in 19, uh, the, the, the Great Depression begins the following year, 1929, um, with the stock market crash and continues, uh, you know, all through the, the 1930s um, up until World War II. And then 2007 is right before uh, the huge um, economic crisis of our lifetimes, uh, the Great Recession of 2008, 2000, uh, 2007, 2008 basically begins, you know, with the the collapse of uh, Lehman Brothers and all these other financial investment firms. And then, you know, there's the, the whole kind of collapse of the, um, the housing market and it leaves, you know, millions of people with, you know, their homes being foreclosed upon or they lose their jobs or they lose their pensions or, you know, it was an economic catastrophe. Um, that unfortunately was felt by the people who had nothing to do with starting it. Um, the people that started the economic catastrophes were, the, you know, the, the banks and the financial speculators and um, the sort of like the real estate industry. And they didn't really suffer the consequences at all. The people that suffered the consequences were um, working people and poor people and marginalized and vulnerable populations. So Reich, uh, Reich has to put this piece together, you know, this, this puzzle together, like why, you know, why do we see this, this reversal in the 1970s? He says at some point in the film, like something happened in the 1970s. And so he's trying to like kind of figure it out. And, and in some ways that's, that's also the kind of the, the, the mission that we take on, especially in the next um, few classes. Like, what is it that happened that started in the 1970s and just has become more and more extreme um, in uh, in our lifetimes. So in the film, Reich kind of makes a distinction, historical distinction between um, two like periods in, in American society and two periods in American history. Um, there are the decades after World War II um, from roughly 19, you know, 40, World War II ends in 1945, um, roughly into the mid 1970s, where we see growing equality, where 
the measures of inequality are actually shrinking during that roughly 30 year period. Um, as we already saw, there's the, there's, there was a reduction in poverty during those years. Um, there was the growth of the so-called middle class. I mean, this is like the boom of like, you know, the suburbs and big cars and barbecues and, you know, it's like, this is the fifties and sixties is it, it especially is kind of like thought of as like the golden age of the middle class. And, um, at the same time, the richest 1% were owning you know, as we saw in the graph before, a declining share of the income and wealth. So, you know, they're still rich, um, but they're not, you know, take, taking home, um, uh, you know, a huge slice of the pie like they are um, in our times. They're not, you know, on super yachts and, you know, going into space and you know, stuff like that. So Robert Reich labels this period between 1947 and 1977, the, the great prosperity. And he says, it's social policies, like, well, you know, why did we have this, this, you know, trend towards more equality? He said the social policies were characterized by higher taxes on the wealthy, uh, by public investments in higher education, housing and highway construction. Uh, by the war on poverty that we mentioned in the previous slide, and also by stronger unions and greater union representation in politics. Those were all kind of like the defining features of those decades. And by no means was this like a, a perfect uh, policy. You know, this was not, America was not exactly like, you know, um, a peaceful, harmonious place during these years. Um, but, you know, it was more equal than it is now. Um, and so he says, you know, also that, you know, while there was greater equality between the social classes during the great prosperity, the inequalities of race and gender persisted. And this was, of course, the catalyst for the civil rights movement and uh, the women's movement and all the movements for, you know, kind of like racial and gender um, equality and justice that came out of the 1960s and 70s were, you know, kind of in, in was uh, a result of the fact that those folks had been like left out of the great prosperity and left behind in this, um, process of equalization that we see between the 40s and the 70s. Um, we kind of like can see this represented in a, a stark contrast between these two periods in terms of um, income gains. So you see that, you know, the, the, the green bars here represent what happened between 1947 and 1979. And again, the population is divided into quintiles of 20%. And you see that during this period, um, all, every single one of the um, green bars increased, right? So the, even the poorest 20% uh, of Americans saw their incomes increased. In fact, the poorest 20% of Americans saw the largest income gains um, during that period by quintile. So, you know, this goes along with like the reduction of poverty. So, you know, but, but everybody basically saw an increase in their, um, incomes, even when you adjust for inflation, they saw an increase in their incomes in this, you know, 32 year, uh, period between 1947 and 1979. And then the red bars represent, you know, from 1979 through 2004. So 25 years um, after this kind of transitional moment of the late 1970s. And here the situation is totally reversed. Um, here, the only people that saw an increase in their incomes were the 1%. Uh, um, or the 1%, you know, really saw the biggest increases that the top fifth and the fourth fifth saw, you know, small 
increases again when you adjust adjust for inflation and so here it's very much more stratified you know so in the in the earlier period uh between 1947 and 1979 it's like a, a rising tide lifts all boats you know like everybody is um sharing in in prosperity and um in the period of the 80s and the 90s it's like you know only the wealthiest of the wealthy are um benefiting and everybody else is basically staying in the same level that they were at uh, in 1979 you know their their incomes are not increasing uh, relative to inflation they're just kind of stuck in in a uh in a hamster wheel um and getting nowhere so i i think this chart actually says uh the most about the story that robert Rush is going to tell you um in inequality uh for all and this this difference between um the period after world war ii and the period after the 1970s it's this chart is is charting um the increases in productivity and the increases in compensation um so compensation being like wages so it's basically a question of like how much are workers benefiting from the increases in productivity that they're doing at work, right? So in the period between 1948 and 1979, you see that productivity and compensation basically mirror each other. The dark blue line and the light blue line are, are in harmony pretty much, right? So that what that means is like workers are producing more at work, um, but they're also benefiting from those, you know, they're, they're getting higher wages that compensate them for that increased productivity, that their increases in their take home pay is commensurate with the increases in productivity at work. And then sometime around 1980, we see the dark line and the light blue line um, begin to diverge from each other. So productivity continues to increase, like workers are churning out more widgets at their workplace um, at the same rate of productivity, basically. You know, so there's new technologies, there's new innovations, there's new methods of organizing the workplace. But whatever it is, like workers, you know, are continuing to to um, maintain a, a high level of productivity that is steadily increasing. But their wages do not. Their wages do not keep up with that. Their take-home pay begins to stagnate, uh, begins to kind of like flatline a little bit there uh, starting around 1980. And so the, the questions that, you know, again, we want to address is kind of like why you know why did we have this this one trend that you know was going on for decades and then suddenly these trends kind of diverge from one another um so workers um did not uh if, if workers are not benefiting from their increasing productivity then who is a hey, how who's benefiting from this gap that's opening up between the dark blue line and the light blue line. And the answer, of course, is, is going to be the, the capitalist class, the, the 1%, the wealthiest of the wealthy. They're the ones that are benefiting from an economy that's very productive, but where workers are making you know, stagnant wages. And then the question comes, well, why weren't workers able to bargain or somehow get a higher you know, wage um, when their productivity continued to be so high? Um, why is it that they were able to be, you know, more or less fairly compensated for their productivity gains in the 50s and 60s? But then by the time the 80s rolled around, their 
incomes are stagnant, even though like they're the economy is just as productive. And here the answer um, that we'll be looking at uh, in future classes will have to do with declining union power um, as sort of a concerted war against unions that has been waged by the business class. And also for a number of other reasons, um, the union uh, density, the, the percentage of people belonging to unions has uh, declined um, pretty precipitously um, from about the 1970s on. And as a result, that has left uh, workers in a, a more vulnerable, marginal position where they're not able to bargain for the wage increases that they deserve. And uh, as a result of that, um, the rich continue to get richer and working people um, are basically in a kind of stagnant position. So I think I'll kind of like keep, um, let you go with that uh, depressing thought. <laughs> and, um, but uh, in the, like I said, in the, in the remaining classes, um, especially in the next few, we'll try to uncover the, the, the puzzle or piece together the puzzle to explain uh, why it is that we're seeing these kinds of trends that were outlined in the first lecture. Um, until then, I'll see you uh, next time. Bye.